you guys about sort of the state of the industry and what's happening in the industry. We want your feedback because we're as puzzled as to where it's going as you guys are. Um, or maybe you're not. Maybe you have some insights into the industry that we don't have. But uh, give you a, we're going to give you a little taste of what we've been doing for the past few years and uh, show you a little reel and then we'll open it up and start talking about uh, the different aspects of our pipeline and how we uh, approach what we do as opposed to, you know, uh, showing you guys our, you know, the actual work because that gets, that gets boring because I'm boring and I talk too much. So. Well, and, and the other thing, you know, like the presentation before us, is I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that will go through the nuts and bolts, the blow by blow of how they create. But we, we want to talk about, you know, what we do with films, what we do with our commercials, I mean, I mean how we dovetail from design, whether it's character and, and then some, some movies are all designed. And others, it goes from design into practical aspects that end up on set. So we'll, we'll talk about how and what we do and what we work. I mean, Legacy Effects does about 25 feature films a year, about 200 commercials. And it, it, ZBrush is a centerpiece for us. I mean, starting back on, I mean, we had it before that, but Scott uh, on Avatar uh, really, with the beta testing and, and taking that program, it really changed our workflow, how we operate. Uh, I mean, it's such an essential ingredient, and Scott has been really instrumental in shaping that program, you know, towards what it is today, you know, based on what our needs are, which seems to serve the industry. So, so anyway. So, uh, like I said, let's show you this little reel first, kind of introduce you to Legacy at large and the guys who are there, and then uh, then we'll open it up and start talking more about specifics and, and how we, and like I said, I really want to hear from you guys because the industry's changing at such a rate right now, and it's it almost feels at times like it's in a free fall because mm -hmm. it, because it hasn't changed into the next thing. It's it's morphing, you know, as we speak. So it, it would it's only going to help us to hear your questions about you know, your perceptions of the industry even, because we're all coming from different places and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to open up something that, that is insightful for all of us. So. To create something that visibly shakes somebody up a little bit, like, what is that? Working with the character to make it really real and believable. That it's got life and performance and can express an emote. Creating a character that starts to live and breathe on screen. When we get a script and it contains a great story, we get passionate about bringing those images to screen. Legacy Effects, we bring ideas into the real world. Everyone here shares a passion for creatures and monsters, robots, characters. We like making the impossible possible. Summer blockbusters to small independent films to a variety of commercials. Black. We kind of do a little bit of everything. Design is the backbone of what we do. For a character that's going to be all digital in the movie, we spend as much time putting in all the detail and bringing that character to life as we would something that we would build. We do a lot of animal reproductions. What we really strive to do is reproduce an animal exactly. And a lot of times they're coming to us because they can't get a real animal to do what the, the script is calling for, whether it's hanging upside down, whether it's talking, I like a nice ham. You know, walking down the street. We're often called upon to do the classic monsters, the Frankenstein and the zombie and vampires and werewolves, and those are great fun for us. But when we get to explore a new character, whether it's an alien or a creature or a monster, that really lets the imagination go wild. For us, it's really fun. 
Something that Legacy FX is becoming known for is our specialty suits. Starting with the Iron Man films, with Pacific Rim, up now through RoboCop, we really have developed a strong niche. We also do a lot of robots. That just seems to be a very popular theme. The character comes from performance, so if we push the details, then it becomes a more believable character. We have a lot of hard surface modeling, and whenever we do robots, you know, we just embrace the technology of direct manufacturing and rapid prototyping. Our particular workflow, I think, is unique in the industry. We really embrace new technology. It's fantastic, I think. It's just like, what could the ceiling be on this? We haven't seen it yet. We've been rapid prototyping for years, and we keep looking for new and innovative ways to use that technology. It's about finding the balance of finance and creativity. It's about paying attention to detail. It's the entertainment of what good makeup or good effects are. It's recognizing the changing landscape and reacting to it. It's about working hand in hand with digital companies to make the most seamless effect possible. It's the joy of watching your stuff affect people in a certain way. Thank, thank you, guys. And now you know how old I am. I've been doing this yeah. for did you, way did you too see, long. Did you see him getting shot in Terminator 2 with the long, <laughs> feathered hair? He's like, whoa. <laughs> it was flowing. He has naturally breezy hair, so it's, <laughs> it's easy for him. It's not as easy for the rest of us who look like protein amoebic masses. Um, but uh, so, you know, let's, um, I guess let's open it up and talk about, uh, you know, how how things have changed and, and what we're doing now. We started off with, um, we started off using a, 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 the first version, or it wasn't the first version, it was like two, two I think, 2.5. Um, I started off using that and that was zero subtools, no subtools, and dealing with Jim Cameron who wants extra of everything and you don't have, you don't have subtools, you don't have anything. Forcing yourself to, to adopt the philosophy of, of, yeah, I can do that, and you walk away going, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? And he, you know, he would, he keep you on that level. Um, you know, fast forward eight years, we have six, th what is it, six 3D printers now? Yeah, we got Huge. Six, six 3D printers. Yeah, yeah. high end, um, we're, there's not a day goes by that those things aren't churning out uh, parts, every one of those parts that is on those From printers came. design maquette pieces to actual pieces that'll be used on screen. We, you know? we actually printed the first makeup, uh, an actual makeup that was printed on our printers a few years ago. We never got to do it because they took that out of the film. But, you know, we went from a tool that was, that you had to understand what it, where it was going in your own mind and you had to believe it was gonna go there to be able to, to look ahead and go, okay, we're gonna be able to do this. And ZBrush has always been that tool. Well, and, and you know, to use that example, what you're talking about with the makeup, you know, Scott just sculpted those makeups on the latest version of Mystique. Yeah, in, those are, those are everything those are was digital on that. I mean, you, somebody could have sat makeups. and done it by hand and it would have been just as valid. But in the design process that we chose to do, it was like, I'm sculpting it, you know? It, it, I'm sculpting it in ZBrush, we're doing it digitally, we're printing it flat, we're molding it, we're using flexible materials, why not take advantage of them? So that's, that's, that's kind of what we specialize in, is taking an idea that may not be something that is in our world, in our practical world, and looking forward to what it could be, and turning, bending that tool to our will. Luckily, these guys at, at uh, Pixelogic have, have always been there saying, stop bending, we will, we will help <laughs> you uh, with it. And, and, and there's a very practical reason behind this philosophy that we, we've slow, not so slowly, rapidly adapted, <laughs> because, uh, you, you know, back when I did a movie like Jurassic Park, there was a year plus time to design and, and, and get all of that in order before even talked about filming. Nowadays, you're lucky if you have three months 
to uh, design and build and take all of that to set. So out of that, you don't want to compromise yourself as an artist, the level of you know, your artistic integrity. So we had to find ways to get that work done efficiently and, and in a shorter time frame and not compromise the art. And so ZBrush you know, became a central tool for that and then naturally falling into the whole RP process, the rapid prototyping, giving you that instantaneous results. You know, those machines are the hardest working guys in the studios. They yeah. run all night long, you yeah. know, for it, it, 60 it, hours straight. It, it's, it's funny how we, you know, we talk about in the old days, the old days, 10 years ago, uh, doing, uh, those are really old days, 10 years ago. A ancient. Um, <laughs> doing artwork for a movie, you either had to sculpt it in clay or paint it or do it in Photoshop. And that's great. That's great. But it's never it's never one to one. It's never what you see is what you get. There's always going to be little things that are going to fall to the wayside. And using all the 3D technologies now in an industry that, you know, cut its teeth on, on clay and, and these kind of things, practical things. It, it was amazing how quickly that was adapted into the, the first time you showed a director a 3D design that was painted and looked good. They went, wow, okay, um, well, all I really needed was a sketch. And yeah, you, but there's, there's another side to that, and I think you might be getting to it, but now by working in total 3D, it's not a lie what you're yeah, presenting yeah. As, a, as, a, as a concept. There was a, you know, for decades, it was a pencil sketch and, you know, you got the beautiful three-quarter view of it that everyone falls in love with. And then, as an artist, you translate that to a 3D sculpture and it looks different because, yes, it might match that three-quarter, but nobody's seen it from another angle. And ZBrush has really opened that yeah, up. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny that, that a lot of people don't realize that we were one of the first companies to start putting this stuff in front of people saying, you know, we weren't presenting it as artwork. We were presenting it as this is what you're going to be getting. It, this is this is not. This is just a step in our chain of getting something to you. And the so, more that was accepted, the more we started getting called in to do things that weren't going to be made practically. That's like right. All the well, the Avatar stuff and the John Carter stuff, and uh, we. I mean, we do a lot of the Ninja Turtle stuff. Yep. It was. They came in and they said we like this part of your process. We got so good at the middle part of our process, they were coming to us for that now. The, the maquettes and that design phase, that uh, it, it's, it's very informative, you know, that, that whole uh, aspect of, of, of what but, we do. But now we're starting to get into a phase, and that's really, I don't know, it's stuck in my head some, somehow, and I, I kind of wanted to talk about it. We're getting to that phase now where directors and producers are bringing stuff from the internet. I mean, when CG Hub was around, everything that the director brought, hey, hey, this is what I want it to look like. It's like, I know that guy. You, you can't, you, I can't do that. Yeah. They were literally taking stuff, and it was like, you know, when you're at home alone in your underwear looking at the internet, hopefully at art, <laughs> and, and you're sitting there, somehow there's a feeling of, I'm the only one looking at this. I can take it, and I'll just show it to this guy, and he'll do it, and we'll be cool. And everybody think I'm a genius. But they, they end up showing this stuff, friends' artwork, people that I, I actually know, and going, yeah, I want this. And you're going, dude, I can't do that. So there's a lot of interaction before directors and producers ever get to you now with these expectations of what they have, and then, you know, so it really cramps the design process a lot of times. So you have to be able to not only dissuade them from stealing, but also tell, you know, convince them that you, you know, you're the guy to do this job. And the only way that you can do that is, is ridiculous turnarounds of, yeah, I'll have it for you later today. Well, one in of our, 3D. One of, one of our things that when we're engaged on a job, you know, they want to see as much as they can rendered out of what an idea will be. So we've, we kind of call it the shotgun approach, you know, where we'll put Scott and uh, Ian Joyner or other of our very talented artists on, on that job, and everybody will just go into their own zone, do their versions of it, and, uh, you know, bash it out and see what we can get on a, it done in a week, and we'll cover a table, you know, 60, 70 designs, and... On, on um, 
was it Cowboys and Aliens, yep. over a weekend, it was four artists, did 67 completely different aliens to throw on the table for a Monday meeting. And, you know, you can do, you can do sketches. These things were 3D. They were 100% because the, inevitably somebody will go, oh, I want to see that one. And, you know, you either got to draw it again or if you have it in 3D, you're able to kind so of. So now what we're designing, what Scott's doing, what the team is doing, they're, they're designing in ZBrush in 3D. So that exact thing doesn't happen. And, and they'll be amazed too, these directors, producers, they'll look at this body of work and they'll go, yeah, we like that or that. But, but once they understand that that is their whole concept that we can look at from any angle, and then the computer will be there, we'll open up the ZBrush or show them. Working, working live, if you work, it, that's another thing. If, if, if people would understand how, what advantage they can have by getting their mind in a place where they can work quickly and efficiently in front of a director, you'll never get the results that you're getting in a... Jim you know, Cameron will embrace that. Andrew Stanton, who has yeah, a beautiful and they'll, and working these, these relationship people will sit with down and they'll Scott, go, oh, huh? yeah, you just moved that. You yeah. just changed that. Oh, my God. How about this? How about this? You get where you need to go. Sometimes, sometimes you're putting teeth on the head and all this stuff because you can, and they're going, doesn't do a nose on the side. And, <laughs> and you, you know, you're, okay, let's reel it back and let's, let's really focus on this. They, so, can, they really em start to embrace the fluidity of the thing. But that, you know, it all has its own, you know, problems. What was the hardest uh, creation you ever had to do for a movie using ZBrush? Uh, anything for Jim Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> anything for James anything Cameron. Anything for Jim Cameron. <laughs> and it's not that it's not fulfilling and it's not that it turned out badly or, uh, you know. The hardest thing to do as an artist is work for another artist. Jim is an artist but on, yeah. he, he, on so many levels that, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it, it is what Scott's saying. You know, it makes that tough because um, it, it's, on a, it's on a whole different level. And, and I think that's what makes it fulfilling, too. I mean, my first film that I count was the first Terminator. So that's my picture in my mind of what a director is. And so... Yeah, I'm and I hadn't worked with Jim until Avatar. Yeah. And I walked in going, I've heard all these stories, I just hope he doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> and, you know, and he was really free with the information and, and what he wanted and how he wanted things done. But the reality was this guy could, with very, very little time and ability, take your computer from you, figure out how to work the program and do it better <laughs> than you. So you, you end up going, oh, okay, well, he, I mean, he did that on, didn't he do that to stand on, on uh, Aliens where it's like, no, this is what I want it to look like, draws it out, and it's beautiful, and you're going, oh, crap, you know, <laughs> I got to live up to this. So as far as hard things uh, to design, hard things to kind of do, it's not when you're not getting a design, that's a miscommunication. When you're not getting what somebody wants, you got to understand that's not doing bad work, that's not communicating. When you're communicating with somebody and you're not reaching the level that they want, that's when, that's when it becomes the hardest because you go, I gotta, I gotta make this happen. I gotta pull myself up, I gotta pull my abilities up, I gotta put it all into this thing. And then, then you become emotionally invested in it and when they don't like it, you know, what are you gonna do? Well, go cry all, like a all of girl. us as artists are very emotionally invested in what we do. It's an extension of ourself. So you always want to please and you want your design to be selected but that's part of the business you also have to learn to put that other hat on that you understand that you are bringing someone else's vision to screen this is actually kind of a rip on the last question that you were talking about i hear in your voice that you're very excited about all the different technologies and stuff but it also seems that there's like a there's kind of a like you're holding something back along the lines of like yes you have all these possibilities but infinite possibilities is also impossible to get something, it slows the process down. So based off the question you said before, I have a, my question is, is there ever a time where you actually just go, no, we can't do that, or no, we shouldn't put pump out oh, 67? I, shouldn't, shouldn't, happens, shouldn't happens all the time. Um, and that's usually after a long involved discussion with the directors telling you, I want this and I want this and I want this, and you go, dude. I, I mean like 63, 67 maquettes over a weekend with four artists sounds 
crazy. Well, it, it wasn't is. maquettes, but uh, yeah, but that was, would be crazy. But they, you could have printed every one of them because they were three D. But the 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 idea, uh, uh, well, what you're saying, yeah, I am. There is a, an aspect that I am holding back, and that is apprehension about where the industry could go with respect to to three D and design. And uh, you know, I said I said something just offhand one day about effects, and I said, you know, the bigger the effect, the smaller the character. And that's the way I've been feeling about things, is, is technology is getting really awesome. I mean, we can do just about anything. We can make anything happen. And, you know, it's not that Frankenstein thing of, but should we? It's not that. It's, it's more to what end? Are we really creating anything that's any better? Are we really just because we can do 67 uh, 3D designs over a weekend doesn't make it inherently better. It just makes it possible, you know? And, and my apprehension is always because the technology's there, then we have to use it. And we have to use it in the way that those guys use it or the way that those guys use it. And that, that's something that you, you walk into every situation with a little bit of apprehension, not knowing how they're how they're going to take the, the technology, how they're going, whether they've embraced it or they're rejecting it, whatever it is, you, you are subject to how they feel about it for, in, until you can either sway them or you just drop all your preconceptions and, and get in line and, and do mo what. Mo most of them don't know the hard work that goes behind it. It's become expected. It, it's the norm that or maybe we've created that for ourselves. No, well, I think that, we that's, have. I that, think that's uh, that's our standard. That's that's the norm. I think I think that that the passion that you hear, like yeah, yeah, I love this stuff. I love this stuff. Which we do. That's what you yeah. want to lead with. But a yeah. lot of times it gets you into working a weekend and doing sixty-seven aliens mm -hmm. because you you are passionate mm -hmm. and you have to find some sort of line between pleasing them finding the technology and not abusing yourself and it along the way. I don't think what we're doing is industry-wide. I think we're very, we're I think they're doing it at a workshop, and I think, you know, us at Legacy are doing this. Um, I think we've crafted this, this niche for ourselves because design and creating iconic characters has always been first and foremost for us. It's the character, and I'm sure some of that comes from my training with Stan, who had an acting background and felt like that was first and foremost. But ever since I was a little kid, the things that I fell in love with was the Frankenstein's monster, it was uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon, it was King Kong. It was, those were characters. Well, they had and, something internal going on. And you're always, as an artist, you're always trying to find that thing. And, uh, you know, being a company that specializes in characters, we kind of had to go there. Because otherwise, and it still happens on it a daily take, basis. It takes what you love most away from you yeah. if you're not yeah. engaged in, in it, creating and doing that. It's actively going after that thing that you love because you will end up with designs from an art department if you don't. And, and if you don't even show them that you're interested, if you wait for them to ask you, if you lead with designs and you lead, hey, we just did these on our own, a lot of times they'll go, oh, well, we didn't know you guys did that. Um, which is one of the reasons that we're here. People still don't know what we do because there's so much that we do do. Does that make any sense? Another, yeah. another, another question? question Run, okay. I'm coming. <laughs> Told you, I'm going to sweat this one. Uh, when you guys first introduced ZBrush into the pipeline, obviously coming from very practical effects and then introducing that, did you, uh, were you met with a lot of resistance? Oh, yeah. That got really um, and, and if so, what did you do to overcome that? I, to, to I, I never, that? As, as an owner of Legacy Effects, and I, I never had any resistance to it. Because when I first met Scott and, and hired him, and then, then shortly thereafter, he went straight into, uh, that little movie called Avatar. It was on that journey with yeah. me. It it just felt like such a natural. Well, uh, it, it was uh, it was a weird confluence of events because I was a makeup effects guy trying to get out of makeup effects. 
I wanted, desperately wanted out. I did not want to do it anymore. And the first company that calls me after I sent out a bunch of resumes was a makeup effects company. So <laughs> I was apprehensive even about showing up. But the, the good part of that was I spoke the same language. I spoke the practical language. I said, oh, you know, if we milled this out or if we printed this out, we could, you know, blah, 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 draft this out, vacuform this, do this. And they're going, oh, you're, because at the time, Stan, when Stan was still alive, they had a digital department, but they were doing shots. They weren't really doing any sort of, Aaron was, Aaron Sims was there. Aaron he was Sims doing was there. digital yeah. design. Uh -huh. Um, but that stuff, was, it was few and far between of them actually prototyping any of that stuff out. And they had a digital department, and they all looked at me like, oh, you know, ZBrush, that's not part of our pipeline. We really don't like it. Uh, we tried it once, that, that old thing of we tried that once, we don't like it. And it's like, you know, that, doesn't, you know, that doesn't cut it. So there was a lot of resistance. And you would be surprised at how much resistance there was in the actual shop practical guys going, the, who the hell do you think you are? You're coming in here and trying to change everything. That didn't affect those guys because I, I'm used to, you the know. The foundation of your art, you know, whether it's being sculpted, to this day, we'll sculpt things in clay, whatever gets the yeah. job done, the right tool for the job. I have the same philosophy when it comes to directors and producers for a shot. I'm not like, oh, it's got to be a practical thing. No, whatever the best methodology is, that's how this needs to be done. Well, we've because had people tell art, us. art driven first. Yeah, well, we've had people tell us, oh, you guys threw that shot away? I mean, we could have done that practically. Yeah. And it's like, they didn't want to do it practically, and it would have been, it would have not as been as good. And, you know, and that's something that's hard for a lot of people as well, is to embrace Ch change, change is, the change is, is and go, hard. That's, not a, that, yeah. that's not a makeup effects thing. You go back and you look at some of the movies that you thought were really cool makeup effects wise, go, go 20 years back and go look at them again. Some of them work and some of them fail so miserably that if it was in a movie today, if you didn't have a love for that movie in the first place, you'd be going, oh my God, I would blow my brains out. But the flip side of that is, I think someone was saying before, you know, if, just because you can do it, should you? I, I, yeah. I see a lot of that, you know, with the, the, the digital animation. Somebody will say, you know, it's just got to be bigger and crazier, and, and they lose that sense of gravity, that sense of weight, the things that ground it so are our eye. I mean, we're in the business of making the unbelievable believable. You know, inventing creatures that you look at and you feel like they could walk in this room. And then when you take away some of the straps of things that uh, make it believable, then you lose that. I, I mean, I, the work that they, the pioneering work that ILM did on the first Jurassic Park, it really does hold up. I mean, you might have better shaders and detailers, and, but they paid attention to the anatomy and how it moved, and does that feel like that animal weighs several tons? And they also it, they also scanned maquettes, yeah. and they used practical, you know. And, we were and, very involved in the digital aspect because all of our sculpting and maquettes translated on screen. I remember being privy to the first uh, sitting in that screening room when they they showed it for the first time, the first test that ILM did of the T Rex. And I'd been very involved with that Tyrannosaurus in, in the first Jurassic, and I'd come up with the whole paint scheme on that thing. And then I, I see that T-Rex come walking out in the field with that paint job that I'd labored over. And it's like, I went, geez, <laughs> this is a game changer, you know, because it's like, there it is. It's walking and it's doing things that we can't do. You know, so it's like. And I, and I think that's why this company kind of embraced it more than a lot of the other ones is because they had that early introduction back on those days of, okay. of a crossover going. Jim Cameron on it can, T2. It can, yeah. yeah, it can still be our design. It can still be up there. There is a place for this. And, you know. The, Filmmaking is collaboration on all levels. So if you're not collaborative, you're not, you're not really engaged. I don't believe that at all. <laughs> no. He's a lead designer. That's yeah. what <laughs> it's mine or nothing. Mostly How nothing. many ZBrush artists are involved in creation of an armor like Iron Man or the suit for Pacific Rim? Uh, we have a yeah, pretty, I love it. You're pretty good staple of, of about, guys. About eight or nine at any given, on any given day. 
right now we're doing a Call of Duty commercial. Um, there's about, about eight, eight guys sculpting away, you know, tearing down, breaking all those armored pieces apart. And, and it's, what's terrific about it too, and we did this to a really large extent back on the movie Real Steel, is incorporating our mechanical department too into this. Yeah. And, and being able to work on top of a body scan, you know, to, so all your parts are being crafted and uh, so you, you know it's gonna fit accurately. Or, or like on, um, on Robocop, Joel Kinnaman's head is, he, the way he stands is slightly off. If we didn't have, if we weren't working and having all these guys, you focus on the helmet and one of the guys goes, the head is, his head is weird, should I correct it? And you're like, that's bone, mm -hmm. you can't do that. So they fixed, they fixed the helmet and it's, it, on anybody else, the helmet is kind Looks of Looks cattywampus. Yeah, it's, it's all weird. Yeah. But, you know, we, because we have so many ZBrush artists now, we can go, can you figure out what, that, what is wrong with this? And, you know, and send them off and they do their thing. And, you know, it's, so it's, it's a lot of guys that it's have a, a lot of skill. I love makeup effects and I love, I love all the skill sets that all the people have in it, but people have a tendency, like, like it's hard for us to explain all the things that we do at, at Legacy because we do so many things, makeup effects started to get more and more compartmentalized into, you know, we're the shop that makes bodies, we're the shop that makes whatever, and it starts to choke you, and you start to feel like, you know, not only is it becoming less relevant uh, if we're not at least collaborating with the digital people, you just start to feel like you're, you're being pushed further and further to the edges and you're involved less and less in the movies. And that, you know, and that's not, not to say all makeup effects companies are that way, but they, but if you notice, just like digital houses get uh, corralled into doing, you know, certain companies do animals really well, certain companies do effects stuff really well, certain people do robots really well. Makeup effects has that same, you know, talent bases that gravitate towards the shop that they're really good at this, they're really good at this. And I just... I wanted the freedom to be able to cross yeah, over Yeah, I, want, I wanted to be able to go, I, you know, I want to work on a movie that doesn't have, it's have to have a guy get his head cut off. Or I want to work on a movie that doesn't revolve around the only time I'm going to see anything that I did on it is a flash of a guy getting killed or something. Because that's really kind of the way it, it was feeling when I got out. It was eight years ago, and, and you know, and I, I walked away from movies, and, and I've, I've never even seen the movie, so I don't, I don't know. But like movies like Hostel, which I, I just refused. I was like, I can't do this. I can't, I cannot kill another person, you know. And you start because it starts to work on your psyche. You're just like, how are we going to kill this one? Um, so yeah, to, to answer it, it's just I felt corralled it too much, and and, the, and as soon as I saw the digital thing happening in a way that was more artistically free that I felt like a design and I felt I was still in that world of creating a dimensional uh, product then then I was cool with, with saying I need out you know but there's a lot of people toiling right now right back there Richie mm -hmm. uh, who should be who should be exploring more of the digital stuff who's super talented and and they shouldn't and I'm not saying that people in makeup effects are stilted in any way <laughs> uh, but you know, they, they should explore more because the, everything is expanding. Everybody needs to, to feel like they're part of the bigger project, I feel. What would you recommend to a young guy like himself who loves CG, he's 18 years old, to get into the industry today? Well, I'll start by one of the great things about Scott and I would say the, a lot of the artists, digital artists, if he's looking to become a digital artist per se, Learn your anatomy, know, know the, the old school foundation of uh, you know, animal and human anatomy and how muscles work. Because if you're, I've seen it where the, the digital artists haven't concentrated on this, this, that aspect. And if you're trying to design creatures and you know, create those kind of characters, you need that background, that backbone. And I think being able to sketch with a pencil and then when you switch over to a ZBrush or those other tools, 
I think it just makes you wiser. And then you go, oh my God, this is so much easier than having to sculpt this whole other side of this head. Now I can mirror and then change. That was, I'm sure Scott's got some thoughts, but that's the first thing that popped in my head is get, make sure your foundation is, is solid. And that's absolutely, that's, that's number one. Number two, learn to talk to people. Yes. Learn to talk to directors. Learn to listen to what directors are saying. It's not a slam on you. Listen to what they're saying. They're not telling you your artwork's bad. They're, they're, they're telling you what they want. And you are the person that is responsible for taking that, their ideas, running it through the prism that is your own artistic ability and making it happen. And if you're not listening, you're just showing your artwork. You're just going, here, how about this? Here, how about this? And, and you, will, you will find that the more you work on your communication skills, I almost stumbled on that sentence. Uh, the more you work on your communication skills with other artists and people around you, the better you're gonna be at doing what you do. Because I've, I've met and dealt with many artists who were just, they just couldn't, they couldn't talk to the director. They couldn't talk to the producer. They had great ideas, you leave and they go, I was gonna say that, you know, we should do this. And, oh, if I didn't and, even bring that like, up, just that would've been great. Just bring it up. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was, ah, well, you know, I just didn't wanna, didn't wanna get in the middle of, what, the meeting about the thing you're talking about, you know, so. <laughs> when you think you know it all, then, then you're done. That's, you're when done somebody, in order. that's when somebody walks up and goes, look at this, and you're like, oh my God, they're, you know, I'll never be that good. I love that, that's my favorite thing in the world. I'll never be a great artist because I am so infatuated with other people's artwork that I'm just like, oh, I don't even wanna try, that guy's so amazing, you know? To, to remain humble and to be able to work with others. So again, eight. <laughs> It's like we're playing bingo right now. Yeah, I got that. This is that's my whatever that thing was uh, that you were doing. How was the experience you guys um, had printing your first 3D print? <laughs> it was pr pretty awesome. I mean, we did it. We outsourced it years ago. We started to get into that. I've always loved models and miniatures, so I've always been trying to find ways to make things better. The time that we we bought a machine and had it an object machine and I think it was we started printing things on John Carter of Mars and when we started messing with the settings and pushing the detail and the uh, you know the level of what it was it, it surprised the it surprised us. The, yeah. It surprised us, and it surprised the manufacturer. Yeah, they like, can't like, print stuff like that. How, so how the hell are you getting that out? It was it was pretty exciting. It was exciting because you see it go from the screen, and then it's in your hand, and it's like it, something magical about that. I, Ian Joyner has the best story about the first 3D print that he ever got. Is like one of the best because he had gotten so used to looking at his sculpture in ZBrush with the perspective turned way up so it was really heroic, you know, and he'd be like, yeah, it looks awesome. And he had sent it out to have it printed and it came back and the legs were about this long, and super <laughs> wide, and he'd, you know, he'd just been looking at the perspective. It's like, it looks great. He gets it back and it's this like guy, it looks like he has a trash can for legs and he's just like, oh my God, I screwed it up. So it, it can be, it, 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 to this day. It can day, be horrifying, obviously. Yeah, to, to this day, you, you send something to print and you're just like, oh, I hope this works, you know? I mean, and we've done thousands and thousands of prints and you still get that little, the little butterfly going up. Oh, girl, Did am we I done push with this? the texture yeah. enough? Am I done with this? I yeah. don't know. When you meet your director, what is he doing or she doing actually when artists get, uh, give him the stuff that he wants or she wants? So what is the director doing while you're sitting there with them? Depends on who the director yeah, is. It depends on whether they're artists, Jim Cameron, again, uh, in very, particular. Very, very engaged. Yeah, I, he I will, mean, he'll look at two, he'll, if you have it on the screen and he's flipping back and forth between two images, which he will notice yeah. the tiniest one. Even if he doesn't like the concept as a whole, he will still examine every aspect of it to see if there's a little nugget of detail or a shape or some aspect of it that could inform where to go. So that's, that's this one extreme, and then the other one you just heard. Yeah, and, then the, and there's, there's directors the artwork who, on the floor. There's directors who operate completely in the limbic brain where they're like, oh, is there a way we can get like maybe 10% more empathy into this thing? And you're going, is that a measurable? Or, or seven and a half percent yeah. more. 
uh, you know, I, I think it needs to be yeah, 8% percent bigger. And you're like, you wouldn't know 3% from 20%. You know, so a lot of times they're functioning from a different side of their brain. or they're And that's where you have to step up yeah. and give them a 10, a 15, a 20, and a 25. Because yeah. the 8 is really not what they yeah, want. They're, they're like, you they're, know I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. set on this. And you bring it in, and they usually have Yeah, like that's a, the one. Oh, the 25. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you print, we've taken to printing things out full scale and putting them against the wall and going, is that what you want? And they're like, oh, my Lord, that's big. Mm -hmm. And you're like, uh, you asked for the 25-foot one, uh, which that happened. <laughs> Favorite project so far? The one that you were most excited about doing? Uh, you know, that is, there's nothing wrong with that question. It, it's <laughs> the one that everyone asks. And I tell you, the, my same retort is, I do put, and I think we're all this way, we put our heart and soul in all of them. It's very disappointing when they don't turn into the Jurassic Park or the Iron Man or the Avatar because you're vested in it, because it's your work that goes up on screen, and you need to be proud of that. You can't, nobody's gonna know in the theater, well, I only worked 70% on that one. No, you're judged for everything that you put out. So every one of these things end up being your babies, and you end up with your, some of your personal favorites. I, I think Scott and I have both been blessed to have worked on uh, uh, a huge body of work that's. Some of them have just been massive pop culture or classic hits in movies. I mean, I think one of my personal favorites was Aliens because the movie Alien is what made me pack up my stuff and move to California to get in this business. I said, I have to be able to do something like that one day. So to actually work on Aliens was a personal favorite, but I've, I've had a lot of them. I, I have to say the same, it's, it's ex coming from the same place. John Carter of Mars, I don't care what it did in the theaters. I don't care how much the designs changed. I don't care who gets credit for what. That was, that book was the reason that I wanted to get into makeup effects because I, I you know, one day they'll make that movie and I will work on it. And <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so that, that, I'm glad there are people who actually didn't yeah, throw we, anything. We were really proud of that uh, work. But, you know that was one of the that was one of the the great feelings of a of a guy who you know Andrew Stanton. We had the same story growing up. He he was introduced to it by someone older than him, and he, he took on this whole thing of like, oh, John Carter, and wanted always to make that movie. And then getting invited to go to Pixar, which is out of your your realm as a as a designer for movies, they have their own world up there, and then get invited up there. And you'd go up there once a week, and that was that was astounding, you know. And I don't care what anybody says. That was, you know, day for day. That was probably the most satisfying because every one of the people on that was an artist, and they respected everything that you did, and you respected everything that everybody else did. So, you know, hands down, John Carter. But hanging out on set with. Steven Spielberg and, and George Lucas standing under an awning, looking at an alien, going, "Hmm, I don't know. That was pretty cool." <laughs> you know, that was on Indiana Jones. That was. It, it's all. It all breaks down to stories. We went over to Amblin, Scott and I, with um, designs to show Steven Spielberg of the Crystal Skull, and we had many different varieties, many different, uh, you know, incarnations for him to look through. And, and Scott also brought his Z brush with him. The first, the, the beta of three. I, so, think was, I think it was 2.5, maybe. I think that's the No, beta, it, was, it, it was three because was it? it had to be three because it had sub-tools. Sub -tools. And that was, I mean, you know, you're going to meet Spielberg and you're sitting, I turn around and there's a full-size Norman Rockwell painting behind me and I was like, that's cool print, no? <laughs> no, There's brush no. strokes there, okay. <laughs> Painting's it's worth more than my It's the famous one of him looking, I think it's in the mirror while he's painting himself. So and that's going, behind no, that's us. That's behind us. That's no In pressure. the hallway, it was Norman Rockwell. We were, it must have oh, been in the Norman Rockwell wing. You look up on the wall, Rosebud from, if anybody yeah. knows, Rosebud yeah. is the sled from Citizen Kane. He happens to own it, and it happened to be sitting across from me. So it was an intimidating um, room to hold his meeting in, for one thing. And we had been given erroneous information, I would say, about, yeah. about the project. And, and somebody was uh, 
very upset that, oh my God, we're not ready for this meeting. And this person went running out to Can't stop to cancel it. the meeting. To cancel the meeting. For some reason, they thought what we had prepared for it wasn't. Was completely wrong. Was, was completely wrong. So he goes out the door. Mr. Spielberg comes in the other door. So we're kind of going, uh oh. <laughs> and he and he uh, he knows he, John. He so he's knew just like, oh, me hey, from a, yeah. Hey, hey what are you guys doing man, here? How are you? You know, and they're like, and, <laughs> Spielberg, yeah. Spielberg just said, hey, what are you doing here? Yeah. Um, and so we put pull out all the crystal skull designs. He starts looking at them. And he's loving. He's loving them. You know. So we, meanwhile, the guy who was going to cancel the meeting is still out talking to the. I can see him in the other room. He's talking to the receptionist, going, "No, we have to cancel this. Because <laughs> we're just not ready. And, and you know, and it's just we just need to do this." And I'm looking, and Stevens is like, "Oh, this is nice. This is nice. This yeah. is nice." And this guy's going, "No, I, you know, just you know, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you have to do. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry." He comes in, sweat pouring down his forehead. You know, and he does one of those almost out of breath, you know, like, things where uh -oh. he's, he's, you know, what are you guys doing? And then doing? he hears it's going great, so then he's kind of slinks uh, to the background. And then Stephen starts saying, well, what if the teeth were on this one and the eyes from that? And you got to understand, we started, un we started unpacking when he was going to, to tell them, well, we're going to, you know, we're doing everything wrong. Everything's wrong, and you should not put the name of the movie on there. And just every little thing, he was, he was having a heart attack. So I packed up my computer and I packed up most of the designs. We're pulling out designs out of the bag. And, and Steven's like, oh, you know, if this was a little different, and I'm like, I could get the computer back open. And I get it open. And I'm, you know, and that John's tap dancing and doing first whatever time he can that, to give me time. That Steven actually saw ZBrush and saw it, w it working, as far as I knew. Yeah, no, he, he, he never, was he like, never what, seen is, it. what is this program? This is amazing. And I go, I can do it for you right here. And, and I had not used three. I had it for about a week and I, and I had sub tools and, and I had the skull and I'm like, Ooh. so, so I'm like, no, we can, we can, we can do we, this. Yeah, we can totally do that. You and can I, do this, I, right, yeah, Scott? I, yeah. John's going, yeah, he can do it. He can do it. Do it. And, uh, I and can't he do stands it. back to get out of the blast zone and I'm sitting there going, okay. Uh, yeah. So, and he goes, hey, what if we take the nose away? I mean, the cavity for the nose. And, and luckily I had made it from a spherical object, so I was able to just smooth it and the nose just go and he's like, Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. You know, and, and he's like and he's like, Can you make the eye sockets deeper? You know, it's gotta have this weird stare. It hypnotizes people. And at this point, we didn't even know what the movie was. We didn't know what the thing was. It was we just the knew we were making a crystal skull. Yeah. And he's you know, so I'm pulling the eye sockets back and he's like, oh, that's really good. And, and he's like, he, and he's, he's standing, he's like, yeah, maybe this, and you're moving it, moving it. And then Kathleen Kennedy walks by, and he goes, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. <laughs> and she's, you know, she comes over, and he's like, look at this. And I'm moving it around, and he goes, can you make the teeth longer? <laughs> and I'm like, sub tool, sub tool, how do you do a sub tool, uh, uh, teeth. And I pull it, and on the teeth get longer, and he's just like, is that amazing or what? He's just doing it right there. And he goes, can you open the mouth? And I'm like, oh, that's two subtools, and I'm not sure I know how to do that. And I, you know, and I do it, and, and I open it, and, and I hit one, and then the teeth go, and I'm like, how's that? He's like, that's amazing. And, and, you know, and him, his wheels are turning. He's like, is that a proprietary program? Is that something you guys own? No, really. And, and so he gets in the thing, and he's just like, uh, he goes, if you deliver that, and, and this is going from disaster, we need to leave, to if you can deliver that, I'll be happy. And John goes, well, what scale? How big do you want it? And he pulls out, he grabs the manila envelope from yep. John and just kind of goes, eh, it was like, like a 16-inch manila yep. envelope. He goes, about that big. Two days later, we come back with a wax print of this thing and walk in and we hand it to him. He looks at it and he's just like, hmm. Oh, that's good. He made a movie icon, and he hands it to me and walks out of the room. And then they give us the script as we're walking out, and it says Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Crystal Skull. And we, we're like, <laughs> <laughs> the Crystal Skull. So there you have it. So that's, uh, that's how you do it live. <laughs> With the um, body scanning technology, is that going to be utilized in your company? Is it going to take certain jobs away from ZBrushers at all? 
Uh, how do you think that's going to be utilized? Mm, you you well, know what? Well, if you want a human, if you want a way. human, yeah. you know, yeah. you're still going to need somebody to clean it up. That may not be that may not be us, but if you want a character, you still got to build a character on top of it. And we do all our own scanning at the shop. Uh, when we when a company wants to pay for it, we'll go get a super high res scan done. But other than that, I mean, it's you know, it's still character creation in the end. Somebody has to create it. If it's not us, then, you know, somebody's going to. So, you know, I'll start edging my way toward whoever it is that gets to do it, you know? I will take it away from you. <laughs> you got another question here from mm -hmm. someone in the audience. Okay. I hope I'm not uh, putting, like, the, the damp around things, but you started off the whole uh, presentation talking about the free fall of the industry. I, did, I said it, there's, a, there's moments where it feels like we're in a free fall because we don't know where exactly each part of the industry is headed. You know, and I, I don't know if, the, if that makes any... So, so I was just curious if you guys could open kind of like with, from your perspective, what are the biggest changes that have you thinking about Hey, what might be coming around the around the other end? Or well, I you know I'm I'm really not sure. That's that's been that's been the biggest question mark lately. Has been, you know, everything. All you hear about is that you know receipts are 15 percent down, and and they're making all these big movies, and they just keep, they keep remaking other movies, and they keep doing sequels to everything, and that's all well and good, but. Uh, for an industry, it's it's like tilling the same earth over and over. It's Eventually, some something's of its soul. not going to grow. Some of the creative soul seems gone. If I'm going to you know speak about something that's negative, you know, having been in this business for 30 years, and uh, you see things shift. Not everything, of course. You can't you know pigeonhole it that, but you see enough of of the ones that are fantastic, and then you see the one the ones that aren't so that seem soulless in that it went from a director-centric business to a corporate-centric business. Oh, where accountants and lawyers have as much say in what's ending up on screen that, you know, as that's the exactly, That's exactly what was in my mind. We worked on something recently that got canceled. I can't say what it is, but every design, and they had not even gone into production. Every design was, was run past the legal department and advertising before we, but you know, I mean, it was like, we're just trying to find our feet here. And they're going, legal says you can't do that. And publicity says it, that they don't like the word, do that, they don't like they things don't, that are icky. Yeah. And you're like, why, that's, is that a measurable thing, icky? So I you think know? that's the downside that we see. I see uh, on, uh, you know, you have, you know, the extremes once again where, Things are being rushed along. Things, it, it, I mean, it's part of why at all the we've, wrong times we've yeah and portions we, of the of the process are being truncated in in parts where they shouldn't be, and and you know and they have this kind of laissez-faire part you know about the you know oh we'll just handle that in in uh, post. Well, you know, I was just so. speaking to one of the audience members here that I've known for 20 years, and he was just coming off of a film that was a makeup-centric thing, and uh, they hadn't really planned for it. And then they're in the middle of shooting, and suddenly, oh my god, we need these things. There's a lot of that that goes on. There's, a, there's um, a young group of people making films that haven't experienced it all the hard way, you know, where everything had to be shot in camera, and there wasn't, well, we're going to broom that till later. There's a lot of broom that till later uh, and, and I, I that think I lot, see on the ones that, that feel like are going off the And rails. a lot of that, I think, is lack of experience of the broader filmmaking, you know, uh, over the years. And I'm, and I'm absolutely not somebody who, you know, pines for the old days. I could give two... No, none of us are what. saying that. You know, you know. It, but it's, it has to do with, uh, you know, when, when you have these big swaths of the industry doing the same thing over and over and over and over, and they start failing at it, and they start throwing money at it, and you're going, what are you doing? You know, and then they see something happen, and then they're, they're so invested in what they're doing, they kinda, they're kind of looking at the other thing that's, that maybe, maybe that's working better, but, they, but you'll see these guys going, eh, no, I, you know, I'm gonna stick to my guns and keep, keep doing it this way. It just, it just feels like we're at a place where it's 
in, you know, when Jurassic Park came out, that was a, that was just a, that was a change. Everybody knew this is, this is going to infiltrate every part of the industry, every part. It's going to change. When Reservoir Dogs came out, everybody goes, independent films. We don't have to spend all this money. These actors finally get to do what they want to do. And now, you know, David Fincher just said, if you want to do characters, you have to do television. When, when did that happen? You know what I mean? So or I'm more this. interested in, in television than I am movies right now because I see that the creative people are kind of going, they're going under the radar right now and going, well, I'll just do it on TV. Nobody's paying attention over there. And they seem to be, they seem to be trying different things. And movies aren't trying different things right now. So that was, that was my free fall between, between you know, these, these big title changes that happen. You just kind of, that, that moment, if you're up here and you kind of feel like it's falling out from under you and you're waiting for the next thing to come up under you and lift you up and, and it's, it seems to be, uh, artistically, it seems to be TV because that's the only place that anybody's doing anything that has any, I mean, you know, uh, forethought uh, to of it, you know? Of course, that's not every single thing. No, it's but, every but single <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. So besides ZBrush, what other applications and disciplines oh, should an artist know when working at Legacy doing the job you do? Doing the job I do? Um, well, I, I kind of answered it before. It's, it's a communication thing, because a lot of times people don't understand what it is that you're doing digitally when you're, when you're having to talk to somebody who you're translating something pra to, to a practical, uh, to a guy who's doing something practically. But the tools no longer, they've never made any difference uh, in reality. If you could do it in Maya and the same amount of time that I'm doing it, and you could get the same product, do it. Who cares? No, you know, I mean, it's that's... It's all about the art. Or, or was I supposed to say ZBrush? <laughs> it's, it's a ZBrush song, okay. No, uh, no, you need, no, you need no, ZBrush? <laughs> no, but no. I, I, it's, that's, I mean, that's the reality, yeah. is, is it, it doesn't really matter. If you, can, if you can communicate and you have a good skill set and you have a good, like John said before, if you have a good foundation artistically, that's all you need. We'll teach you what you need to know. If you come to work there, trust me, so, there's a lot of opinions about so, what you should so be doing. On, on top of that, right, obviously artists coming from a traditional or from the digital world, the hardest thing is understanding those three printers and rapid prototyping, right? Uh, so I, I, I don't know if most them? of them don't understand that coming in, but right. they learn. And, and we're not asking learn, them to for no, the most part. No, and that's what Scott's referring to as far as teaching, you know, because that, because even if you, I mean, it would obviously be helpful if you came in and you had that understanding, that would be great because a, a lion's share of what we do ends up going through a physical pipeline, even if it's just a maquette. But uh, we'll teach the specifics of that, you know, to, to yeah, you. Yeah, if your foundation is good and your communication skills are good and you can, you know, you don't take everything as a slam against, you know, well, that's, it, we gotta do it this way. Well, I, you know, I do it this way. Well, that's fine. If you can do it in that amount of time and it all works out, great. But, you know, you just have to be able to communicate. And I, and I, it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but we're not, it's not rocket science. And if you have artistic skills and you have communication skills, you can work anywhere. And I just wanted to say thank you for reminding me, if not anyone else, why we, I, I fell in love with this art in the first place. It's been awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah.